Support for The Art of Sway and all the other shows in the Marketing Podcast Network is provided by Memento. If you have your own podcast, you know producing it is half the battle. Promoting it is the other half. What if you could upload your episode, video, or audio and have AI pull out the best moments to use in social media promotions? You can with Memento. Upload the video or audio, review the recommended clips, click a couple of buttons, customize the colors and fonts, and hit save. Instant Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, Facebook or LinkedIn posts, all with video or audio embedded for dynamic promotions that drive people to the episode. And the AI kicks out show notes, transcripts, and even social media captions. All you do is review and post. Go check it out. MPN listeners can try it for free at bit.ly slash memento MPN. That's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash memento M-P-N. Welcome to The Art of Sway, the podcast that uncovers the power of influence and its impact on all areas of our lives. I'm your host, Danielle Wiley. Each week, we'll explore the many facets of influence through candid conversations with industry insiders, from brand marketers to social workers, educators, leaders, and more. Let's dive in. Leslie Polizotto is the co-founder and owner of The Donut Project, a handcrafted gourmet donut shop in the West Village of Manhattan. She is a former litigation attorney who had a passion for food and fine dining. When the opportunity to help open a donut shop was presented, she took the leap into entrepreneurship, creating one of the leading donut brands in the United States. The shop takes inspiration from food and cocktails for their donut flavors and is sought after by national and international brands to do collaborations and custom donuts. Leslie oversees daily operations and handles the business side of the brand. She leads a team of four female pastry chefs to create the one-of-a-kind donuts, including new weekend specials every week that are available Friday through Sunday only, leading to customer lines around the block. The Donut Project has received extensive press for its unique donut creations and for the many collaborations it does. The shop has been featured on many national and international television shows and has a global following on Instagram of over 155,000 followers. Leslie's motto is, it is never too late. She graduated UCLA at the age of 36 and graduated Pepperdine University School of Law at the age of 40. Leslie became a business owner at the age of 46. I was introduced to Leslie by our season one guest, Jared Watson, and I am so glad he made that intro. This was an utterly unexpected and fascinating conversation, and trust me when I tell you that you probably need to be close to your kitchen or a local donut shop while you are listening. This conversation will make you hungry. Enjoy. Well, hi, and welcome to the show. I'm so excited that you agreed to come on and thrilled that our mutual friend, Jared, introduced us to each other. Yes, thank you for having me. I always love telling my story, and so I can't wait to tell you all about the Donut Project. Yeah, yeah. So I, we pretty much start every episode. I have my guests tell me a bit about their career journey, and I kind of cracked myself up with my dad joke of your story really taking the cake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> pun intended, um, for most fascinating. So I'd love for you to share with our listeners how you went from law to donuts and just kind of take us through what your journey has been. Yes. Um, my journey is definitely unique and I'm sure some of the people I used to work for at the law firm probably thought I had gone insane, but, um, you know, I never intended this, you know, when I was practicing law that I was going to open a donut shop. That was, that was never the intention. It was kind of a situation where the stars aligned. I was practicing law in LA. I moved to New York. I had intended to practice law in New York. I took the bar, had to do everything all over again and uh, passed it. But the law firm that I was working for, which was a national firm, their New York office didn't quite have enough work to bring me on. So I was kind of waiting around and I became friends with a bartender who mentioned to me that he wanted to open a donut shop. And I pulled out my phone and I showed him all these pictures of donuts that I would take when people would bring in donuts to the law firm and how happy they would make me and how I just could see how the whole dynamic of the room would change when 
you know, donuts were brought in and I, you know, I told him, Hey, I'll, you know, I have some time on my hands. I'll help you with a business plan and raising capital and, and things like that. The process itself was really fun. And I really started to enjoy creating a concept from the ground up and, you know, midway through that long process, my firm had a position for me and they reached out and I, turned it down and just kept going in the direction I was going and kind of dove, you know, head first into opening this donut shop. I, you know, I was a foodie. I kind of knew I wanted to get into the food business at some point in my life. And this was kind of like mm-hmm. an entry level, I thought, uh, way to get into the food scene. And, you know, so I, I was fortunate enough that I had, a, you know, a spouse who was like, sure, go for it. <laughs> because most people, would not be so thrilled when their spouse gave up a six figure income to not take a salary for over a year. Yeah. So the journey was definitely unique, but I'm so glad I did it because I could never go back to working for someone else or not that I don't miss practicing law, but I'm very happy with my choice. Why don't you tell, I mean, I gave a little bit of info through reading your bio to everyone, but why don't you share what the donut project is? Like, I, I know you have two locations, like just tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Well, actually I have one location now and we'll maybe okay. talk, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, yeah. when we talk about the pandemic, but the donut project uh, opened in October of 2015. We're in the West village. We are a handcrafted hand cut. Everything's done by humans, no machines, donut shop that takes inspiration from food and cocktails for our flavors. So we use ingredients like sesame seeds, beets, ricotta cheese, olive oil, black pepper, we bacon, we use a lot of unique ingredients that at the time in 2015 had never been done before. So it's a very unique uh, brand that does a lot of collaborations. And every weekend we have two weekend specials that are only available for three days and then they go away forever or at least a year. So yeah. there's always something new that people want to get. I love it. And are these, I love donuts, but are these cake donuts or yeast donuts or both? They're all of the above. We okay. started initially with yeast and then we added cake and now we have uh, French curlers, which is a pate de choux dough, it's a completely different dough. We have vegan cake, we have gluten-free cake. So Keep in mind, each time you add a different type of dough, it's adding a whole nother process yeah. into your into your um, business. And what's interesting about the donut biz is every day you start with nothing. You have to make it to sell. So it's not yeah. like ice cream where you open up the store and the ice cream's in the freezer and it's all there waiting to sell. We have to make it to sell every single day. And so that's the challenge. It seems to me this is the type of business that's kind of tailor made for social media, right? Like donuts are just so like they can be so beautiful, they can have different colors. You're doing these unique weekend concepts that kind of come and go. They have that kind of like fleeting nature and people are excited to share them. Like what do you think is different about starting a business like this now in the age of social media versus before where that kind of, where word of mouth was truly just word of mouth, but now people are showing what they're eating and sharing that out with the world in a different way. Right. Well, yeah, it's um, honestly, I would not have survived if it wasn't for Instagram specifically, because Instagram is a very visual platform and my, my donuts are very visual. We kind of came into the donut scene just when Instagram and food was kind of coming into its fruition. Now it's probably the most popular thing that's posted on Instagram. It was very new. And so we were fortunate enough to actually get a lot of exposure, global exposure through Instagram because of our unique donuts. And I have people from all over the world, Scotland, Japan, they come in and they say, we've been following on Instagram for three years and we're finally here. I mean, Mm -hmm. my brand is a global brand. People from all over know it, but it's a tiny little shop in the West Village and it's me and three people. It's amazing. Yeah. And it's all because of social media. If if I had tried to do this without social media, it would have failed because no one would have known who we were. When we started, we were woefully undercapitalized, didn't have any money for PR or marketing or anything like that. 
it was all social media and I've never paid one penny for marketing. That's amazing. And do you do, do you find that you just in terms of the design of the shop and how you present the packaging and is, are there things that you do to make your shop, to make your product more social media friendly, more Instagrammable, or do you just kind of put out the amazing product and let people take it from there? Do you like nudge it at all through hashtags or yes. like photo I mean, ops or, you know, that sort of thing? We definitely are very cognizant of the visual of the donut. Uh, first and foremost, it has to taste well and make sense. I don't do anything just for shock value or anything like that. It's based off of a dish or dessert or a cocktail. And so it all makes sense. The ingredients do uh, flavor profile wise, but as far as visuals, I'm a small business. I do all of my content creation. I handle my social media account. And when uh, we are usually mocking up weekend specials on Wednesdays uh, and I take all, you know, photos and videos and I I do all that on Wednesdays to post at five o'clock so that at five o'clock on Wednesday, you know, what's coming this weekend if something isn't looking beautiful, we will make a change because it does need to catch someone's attention just to get them to even dig further to find out, hey, what is this and what is the flavor? Mm -hmm. So visuals are definitely 100% in the forefront, but it also has to taste good. Uh, My shop is a very visual shop. It's got street art on the walls. It's got, it's kind of a concept of Paris art salon meets, you know, Lower East Side, New York. It's uh, graffiti with gilded frames around them. We have chandeliers, kind of the whole premise that we're taking a, you know, kind of a street, a donut you could buy on a street vendor and we're elevating it to be glamorous and, and beautiful. So that's kind of the whole concept of the donut project. What do you do to take advantage of the content, like the user generated content that you get? So when people come into the shop and they post their photos and they share it out. I'm assuming you kind of help amplify that to push it further. I do. I usually repost every story that's done. If it's, if it looks nice, yeah. if sometimes people <laughs> like the, they've traveled with it and it looks like it was thrown on the ground and stomped and then they take a picture of it. I'm like, Oh, that's not very appealing, but 90. 90- We've seen the same thing, <laughs> even when we're paying it to create content. 90% is good. <laughs> we were working on a campaign recently and someone sent in photo. It was for a baked good product that you make at home and they burnt it. And then they like submitted the content. We are like, no, you can't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Yeah. I mean, we get a lot of professional, um, you know, influencer people who are on TikTok and, you know, all of the above and they have very sophisticated way to create content and it's always beautiful, but your average customer is just someone that wants to post what, food item they they've eaten on Instagram for their own personal for you know whatever and we will repost most stories when they they look nice and I comment on I I respond to all comments and all dms so there is engagement from the brand with whoever does post and and tag us that's a ton of work it is It's a lot. It's a lot. But I mean, people have said, why don't you farm that out? Why don't you have someone come do it? But my business is so in real time. It's not like I have pictures for a donut for a month from now. It is on the calendar and we know it and we're starting to test it, but I probably don't have that content. And it, it's just, it's just easier for me to do it than to wait around for someone to show up and do it. And I know what needs to, to be done and it can be done very quickly. And so I just tend to do it myself. Spoken like a true type A yeah. woman. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> and do you have a lot of influencers coming in and trying to get free donuts or barter? Or how are, how do you handle that? Yes. We, I know a lot of small business owners really struggle, or even big, large business owners yes. struggle with that. It yes. can be overwhelming. I, I have people from you know all over the world. I'm going to be in New York this week. Uh, when can I schedule a time to come? to your shop. And so some of it's very high level. And then some of it's just, you know, someone who's trying to start a a foodie blog and, you know, they have hardly any followers and they, they, they're asking me for free product. And I mean, sometimes I, I will, you know, give somebody a free donut, but I, I tend to just try to work with people who have established, you know, influencer brands and 
And it's not always the person with you know, 100,000 followers. A lot of people with like yeah. 10 to 15,000 followers have a lot more engagement with their their followers yeah. and really can generate a lot of you know publicity for you. And so I, I tend to work with certain people that I know are great people and have great followers. So, but I mean, I encourage anybody who wants to, you know, come in and take, I mean, you can come in and buy a donut and generate tons of content and tag us and we can retag you and help you. Um, so, you know, I do that as well. Yeah. Awesome. So kind of, I could talk about donuts for <laughs> another hour, but I feel like we should talk about some of the meteor stuff. I'd love to talk to you just about in, in general about switching careers in mid life. So yes. I, I think it's tempting for a lot of people as they approach a different stage of their life and kind of are looking back and seeing what's ahead and wondering if this is all there is and do they feel fulfilled? I mean, I, I don't think that's uncommon, but it, it can feel impossible. It can feel scary if you have a family, as you know, you talked about your husband, like it's not just your own life, really. Like you don't, necessarily have full control over your own life because other people are depending on you and you've set up this whole family structure that right. maybe depends on the income that you're bringing in. So what advice, I mean, obviously everyone's home situation and financial situation is different, but maybe mm -hmm. just in terms of like the psychological piece of it or having, presuming that you have the financial wherewithal to make the leap, what advice would you have for getting past that scary piece of it and just being able to take that leap. Yeah. I mean, switching careers is tricky, especially when you're switching from, you know, a, a steady paycheck with a company to starting your own business. And quite frankly, it's not for everyone. Um, if you like working and leaving and not thinking about the work you just did until the next day, uh, starting your own business or switching things up is not, not for you because specifically, you know, when a, you start a business, it's, it's, every day of your life, you're thinking about it. So it's, it's not a nine to five. It's pretty much integrated into your life. But I'm, I'm, I've always had the motto, it's never too late to change your career path. I actually didn't even start going to college until I was 29, community college, and I transferred into UCLA. And I graduated at 36. I went to law school at 37. I started my own business at 46. So there's no rules. Rules that don't say, apply to you. No, yeah. they don't apply to me. And it's, I tend to make very large, big changes. For one thing, I think there's three key things for people that are trying to make a change or started their own business. And I hear it all the time. I have finance people come in and they're like, oh, I wish I could start a bakery. You know, I people that are in high stress professional careers, I think love the idea of escaping and, and just taking, they think it's more simple, but quite honestly, my business is just as stressful and hard as when I was an attorney weirdly. But, you know, I think first you have to really love the concept or the product or the new career that you're, you're going into because it's not, like I mentioned, it's pretty much integrated into your life and it's going to be all you think about for a very, very long time. Second, I think it's really good to, you know, partner with people who have skills that you don't have. Initially, the, the partner that I worked with who left three years ago, I had hospitality experience. And I was, you know, I was a fine dine, you know, fancy persons, you know, coming into the restaurant, but I didn't understand the other side of hospitality. And, you know, I'm so glad that I worked with someone who knew that side because I might know how to do all the business stuff, but he knew how to do how you treat customers and how, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's good to partner with people who have skills that you don't have. And then Right. Lastly, right. I would say if you're willing, if you're going to make a change or or try to start a business, it, you have to have support of your your spouse and your family or friends because, like for me, I gave up an income and you know you have to be able to financially do it, and then you also you need people to vent to because it's very difficult making huge career changes, and it's nice to have people supporting you and encouraging you that you're doing the right thing because it's it's definitely a challenge. And sometimes you're like, what, what have I done? I mean, I used to drive a fancy car and work in an office and have a secretary. And then I was like washing dishes and sweeping the floor and you know, like pulling espresso shots. And I was like, sometimes you're like, what, what's happened? You know, I love it. And I would never, I could control it. And so there's, there's no going back to working for someone else. So I would say those three things, just make sure you can do it financially. You have support of friends and family, 
and make sure you really like what you're diving into because it's going to consume you for a very long time. One of the things I have found super helpful just in, in owning my business and the stress that comes along with that is having, having support groups that are separate from my family, friends, and separate from my business partners, because everyone has those two groups have ulterior motives, right? Like my business partners want every decision that gets made to benefit the company. My husband wants every decision that gets made to benefit our family. And sometimes one or the other of those might not be the right. There are other factors, right? Like you can't make every choice based on a bias perspective. So I've joining like other group groups with other CEOs, even in other industries and just communicating with other business owners and having mm-hmm. places to go and to vent and like people to hold me accountable who don't really have, have zero skin in the game of what I'm doing has been so helpful right. to me. Right. Support for The Art of Sway and all the other shows in the Marketing Podcast Network is provided by Memento. If you have your own podcast, you know producing it is half the battle. Promoting it is the other half. What if you could upload your episode, video, or audio and have AI pull out the best moments to use in social media promotions? You can with Memento. Upload the video or audio, review the recommended clips, click a couple of buttons, customize the colors and fonts, and hit save. Instant Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, Facebook or LinkedIn posts, all with video or audio embedded for dynamic promotions that drive people to the episode. And the AI kicks out show notes, transcripts, and even social media captions. All you do is review and post. Go check it out. MPN listeners can try it for free at bit.ly slash memento MPN. That's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash memento M-P-N. Yes, I've I've kind of built a little network of female, you know, people in the business that, you know, are in bakery business. I, and I've actually made some friends with, uh, you know, female donut shop owners who are in awesome. other states and come to New York and visit my shop and I visited their shop. And so it's nice to swap stories and vent and how do you handle this and, and, you know, get feedback. Um, I'm really good friends with, um, Ginny who has a donut shop in Frisco, Texas called detour donuts. And she comes to New York a lot and we go out to lunch and we, we powwow, we talk about everything. And it's it's really nice to, you know, compare notes and find out. And it's kind of helps you realize that you're not alone and that other people are going through the same thing you're going through and they have the same issues. And so it's, it's nice to have camaraderie in your peer group. So yeah, I definitely agree that is essential as well. I thought you were going to talk about this when you were talking about financial people, because I I think I always assume financial people with naysaying, (laughs) but just curious to know how you handle the naysayers. Cause I feel like, I mean, and this kind of gets down to like everyone having their own kind of secret motive, but with every big move that I make, certainly there's always someone who feels the need to share their perspective on that or their opinion, whether it's solicited or wanted or not. And just wondering, I mean, I can imagine going from law to donuts, there had to have been some people who wanted to share their thoughts on how crazy that was <laughs> and why you shouldn't do well, it. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people were like, what is she doing now? Kind of, you know, this is nuts. You went through all that law school, you know, taking the bar, you know, it's, it's not easy to become a lawyer. If it was, everyone would be one. And it's, you know, because you make good money and it's a professional career and it's very difficult to become one. But, you know, actually the naysayers were more when we were trying to rally up people to invest, they would, they were like, well, there's donut shops already in New York city. Why would, why are you, how are you going to make any money? Like, how is this going to work? Like, why, why donuts? They're everywhere. And so it's, I'd say it's 50 per, well, maybe even 80% naive, being naive and thinking, oh no, we're going to, we're going to make this work. I mean, you know, I am never quit type a do whatever it takes kind of person. And I was like, I'm, this isn't going to fail. There's no way I'm going to make it work. But there were people who were, were not very 
committed to like thought the concept wouldn't work. I was committed to the concept. There's nobody in New York or anywhere doing donuts with beet and ricotta yeah. or olive oil and black pepper. There's there's nobody doing this. So we're we're make we're kind of opening a new market. It's more adult, you know, it's a donuts that aren't so sweet. The flavors work and you know, New York is a all about food. It's a food capital of the world and this makes sense here. And you kind of, you know, have to believe in your concept. And again, I think it was a little bit being naive. 85% of food businesses fail in the first year in New York. So the fact that I've been open for seven and a half years is something's right. And so I think I do tend to take what people say very, you know, to heart, but I think I was so, you know, just really behind the concept and naive that I believed we were going to be successful. So I tend to, I tended to just ignore them. It was funny when we were renovating the shop, this, this old man poked his head into where our, you know, the, the, where we are and said, nothing ever works here. (laughs) And we were like, (laughs) thank you. I mean, it was that, that kind of stuff. And you're just like, Oh, well, don't listen to that person. And and here I am, you know, seven years later and who knows where that old man is, but it's nice to have staying power in a city where people typically don't make it. Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. So speaking of tough, you mentioned COVID earlier. I don't know that there's a business around that didn't have some kind of impact from the pandemic. How, how did it change things for the donut project? I'll be completely honest. It saved my business. Literally 100%, I would have probably closed down if it wasn't for the pandemic. Um, Before the pandemic, I had two locations. I had the original location in the West Village where the donuts were made. And I had a second location up near Central Park where it was a small, tiny little shop where we would drive the donuts in a van up like two or three times a day. It was a nightmare. I mean, literally a nightmare. It was super expensive. The rent, the employees were hard to manage. It It was just a nightmare. So before the pandemic, two locations open every day, nine hours a day, 25 employees, was hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, made not one penny. After the pandemic, I closed down the second location, reduced the hours to five days a week, five hours a day at the original location, had to lay off a lot of people and just kept a couple professional pastry chefs who were really good. And we just, we stayed open and we had people from all over driving in to get donuts just for some sense of normalcy. They would come in, we would have it ready. We, they would pre-order, we would have it bagged up. They would come in, they would grab it and they would leave. And they were just, people were so happy that we were open. And we had this unique treat that could bring some happiness into their life because New York was the epicenter of COVID and it was horrendous here. I mean, people were not, there was no one on the streets. It was insane. And so we just stayed open and slowly but surely I just started making money, like becoming profitable and paid off my debt and I've paid off all my investors. I've completely turned my business around because I've learned that less is more. I don't have to be open like Dunkin' Donuts 24 hours a day because I'm not Dunkin' Donuts. I'm a boutique donut shop. I I always say we are like Prada. We're not Mm H&M. We are a very high-end concept that you have to plan to get. If you want donuts at 10 10 o'clock at night, well, you're not going to get them from me. You can get them from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. And that's it. Yeah. And it works. Wildly, it works. So I, the pandemic literally made me pivot into a different type of model because in New York, you think you have to have a location on the Upper West Side, the Upper East Side, downtown, over here. But New York is a tiny, tiny island. People think it's this huge place, but it's not. There's millions and millions of people here, but it's a very small footprint. And it's just not necessary for me to pay double rent. It's just not. I, there's no reason for me to have locations in anywhere else than I do, because people will come to me. So the pandemic was a huge savior for me. And I sometimes feel guilty about it because so many businesses closed, but for some reason it worked for my business and we just pivoted and it, and it made us more successful. I don't know that I've ever been through a tough time. I mean, my company's been around for just about 12 years now, and I don't know that we've ever been through a tough time where we didn't come out of it in some way better 
than we were before. Because well, you it, learn lessons. You have to re-examine yes. things, you know, like you look at everything, you figure out where you're duplicating efforts right. or double spending or right efficiencies like those hard times oh, yeah. yeah totally like with labor i mean my expenses are ingredients labor and rent those are my top top expenses and with labor i learned that if you if i work with professional pastry chefs this is their career this is what they want to do and i pay them very well and uh, we all work together as a team and there's no we're all the a team there's no b team there's not somebody working today or tomorrow that none of the other people, we're all together all the time. We all have Mondays and Tuesdays off, you know, it's very regimented and they, they, they take it serious and they're, they support the brand versus having, you know, a lot of employees that are just even maybe going to stay for six months and then go find some other job. So it's, it's, I found investing in professionals, and, and paying them well and treating them well has is the way to go. I'd rather pay fewer people more money than have a lot of people who are yeah. less quality. So that's that's what's a hard for lesson me. for business owners to learn. Yes. But it's yes. I mean, I feel like nine times out of ten, they you know once you do that, you realize the truth of it. I mean, me me and my th- three uh, female pastry chefs, we we do the output that I probably used to pay 10 people to do. I can believe it. No joke. And so that, that happens because of the pandemic, just, Oh, I'll get a better equipment. I'll do this. You know, I'll make some improvements. And I took advantage of PPP loans and made some upgrades to my business, the equipment and made my business more efficient. And it runs like a, you know, well-oiled machine now. And it, you know, therefore I can make money off of it. And yeah, uh, that's the point uh, when you have a business is you have to be profitable and or otherwise it, it doesn't really make sense. So I, the, the pandemic helped me figure out how to be profitable. Fascinating. So I, you mentioned earlier, we kind of got more into the weekend specials, but you mentioned collaborations earlier. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to touch on that because in, in the influencer marketing industry, collaborations is like the big buzzword Mm -hmm. that you see around everywhere and just I would love to understand how you take advantage of I mean I feel like it's kind of big even like in the music industry and right like collabs or everything how does it work in donuts (laughs) well I I like to say this is crazy but I always like to say we invented collaborations because I've been doing collaborations since June of 2016, we started partnering with alcohol brands because we were started to get press and known that we've created donuts with like cocktail glazes. And so Angry Orchard, which is a hard cider, reached Mm -hmm. out to us and we did a huge collaboration with them. And I've worked with all alcohol brands. I've worked with national. I've worked with Hormel, Skippy, Haichu, Belvedere Vodka. I've worked with Estee Lauder Cosmetics. I've worked with you name it. I've worked with them. And we just became known for doing collaborations and my collaborations, they, they, they're kind of different levels. I work with local businesses and restaurants where, um, like this weekend we're, we're doing a, um, donut inspired by a new spring dessert menu item at a restaurant that's, uh, in the West village. And so we're creating a donut using all of the ingredients that they've, they're using in their dessert. And so that's just a way for us to promote their restaurant and, you know, it's, just fun. And we always are looking for creative ideas every weekend. When you change every weekend, you need Mm -hmm. to have, you know, a source for those, for those donuts. So the, the collaborations has been a way for us to always have something new. And then when I partner with bigger brands like Haichu Candy or or Hormel or Skippy Peanut Butter, who sponsors my peanut butter and jelly donut, by the way, they actually provide the peanut butter for that. I also work with Brooklyn Gin, who provides me with the gin, and I do a a Brooklyn Gin cocktail glazed donut that's always on my menu. So I've actually turned it into more than just collaborations. I've turned some things into ongoing partnerships. But when you work with a large brand, they have PR teams and they have money. And so they will Mm -hmm. do media drops. So when we create the donut, we'll send donuts to like all of these daytime TV shows or, you know, food blogs or Time Out Magazine or food and wine or whatever. We'll send packages and sometimes they'll do custom boxes. They'll do custom bags. They get 
press, you know, in, in articles online, magazines and stuff. So by partnering with these brands, I get to use their PR team and get all this press okay. and I haven't paid for And I haven't paid That's for amazing. it. amazing. <laughs> My brain's like going a so, hundred miles. I'm like, how do I? <laughs> no, I know. It's amazing. And then the local thing, you know, the local restaurants, it's a completely different collaboration. Right. It's just us working together. But, but every so often I do work with larger brands where it turns into a media, which we send it to influencers and then they post about it. And then it just gains steam and traction. The more posts there are about it, the more stories there are about it, the more articles that are you know put out there, then it just generates more interest in that donut. And that donut will be just like huge, huge weekend special. So collaborations are very important to my business. Not only do I get free PR, but it gives me new, new donut ideas for I love it. every week. I love it. And so I, before we get to the final question, I had to touch on the fact that you have an all female team. So do we. And just was yes. curious, was this deliberate? What do you see as the benefits of it? Tell me more. <laughs> it wasn't, initially it wasn't deliberate because my my business partner who left uh, three years ago, he moved back during the pandemic because his family was in Seattle and he, he just was yeah. like, had to go back. And so I just kept doing it by myself. And I had two female pastry chefs that, you know, were working and we just were really doing well. And I, you know, I've hired more pastry chefs and I don't say only women apply. I mean, that's illegal, but nine times out of 10, most professional pastry chefs are female. Quite frankly, it's allowed us to have a very friendly camaraderie. You know, the team, the team is very small and there's, you know, I've had a lot of men work in the shop and at least from my experience, any, any guys that have worked for us prior to the pandemic, they tend to not like to take direction or be told what to do by a female. And so it just kind of, I've found we seem to work together better when it's all girls and we're working towards the same goal. I feel like girls work harder. I don't know. I just, it's worked well. And so I'm kind of happy with having all female and have, but if some awesome male pastry chef wanted, you wanted to work with us, of course I would say yes, but it just so happens that all the good, good people I've uh, had the opportunity to meet have been female. Yeah. It's kind of been the same. It happened kind of accidentally for us as well. And same as you, like we don't, we don't specifically say female only and we are not opposed to it, but I, we very rarely get a resume from right. a guy. Right. And I, you know, female owner, female head pastry chef. And so guys tend to think they know more than the women and they usually don't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, it's really good. And we just, you know, it's very easygoing and relaxing. Like we, we hustle. I mean, we're only open five hours and obviously we're working there for hours before we open and we, you know, have to work a little bit after we close because we have to clean and prepare for the next day. But it's hustle time. I mean, mm -hmm. our day, our our weekends, because of the specials, it's like Friday night dinner at the most popular restaurant. It's hustle. It's hustle, hustle, hustle. And I just think some guys just aren't, you know, they want to break. I don't know. I just feel like girls are hard workers. I, I think women too. There's a different level of multitasking. Yes, I agree. I've been asked before, you know, why do you think women are better business owners. And I'm like, because we're used to wearing all kinds of hats. We're used to doing 15 things at once and taking care of, uh, you know, 15 different areas of a business is just is very similar. I mean, women tend to be able to multitask really well and handle things and are much more structured and planning and calendaring things. And I don't know, we just, we try to, we have so many things going on, so many balls in the air and wear many hats. It just, that's perfect for a business owner because you, you have to yeah. know how to do everything. I mean, no, there's no job description. Yeah. There's no boxes to check off. There's no annual reviews where you're told how you're, well you're doing when you have your business it, every day, there's new challenges, new opportunities. You have to figure it out. And so it's, you know, it's women are really good at that. I found I mean, I think I've always been pretty good at that as a woman. And then when I became a mom, there was like a whole other level of it. Like I'd be at oh, work yeah. and someone would come in crying and I'm like, oh, you're going to cry. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> yeah. You want a Band-Aid or a nice pack? 
get out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's like problem solving. I mean, we just know how to problem solve because there's, oh, you know, this is not working and, oh, I need to get out of the door and, oh, I need to drop you off here and, oh, you need money for this. I mean, there's just, there's so many things going on in the life of a woman every day. And that's exactly what the qualities you need to have for, you know, to run yeah. a business because there's yeah. always something that's going to go wrong or not as you planned. And I mean, I've, you know, we've been open seven and a half years and I've recently gone through a lot of equipment issues recently because they've seen the end of their life. And right. it's like, everything kind of happens at once and you're like, Oh my God, but you just do it. You take care of it and you move on. I mean, women are strong and we can handle anything. So that yeah. works for me. On that note, what woman had the biggest influence on you and your life and, and career? Just kind of to give a shout out to another woman out there. You know, it's, this is horrible. It's, I, it's actually, I don't have a woman that's had a huge impact on my life, unfortunately. I, you know, I'm not very close to my family and my family. I was the first to go to college and the first to do a lot of things. And so I'm like an anomaly from my family. And so uh-huh. there's no one there that really like pushed me to do any, any of the goals I've achieved. It's all been kind of me just doing it. Honestly, the, the most, the person who has impacted my life the most has been my husband. We've been together 22 years. Um, so he's been with me all through my education, all through, oh, I'm done. I finally graduated college. Now I want to go to law school. I mean, what husband would be like, sure, go for it. You know, he's been so encouraging to me. And then he encouraged me to, to, start my own business. He's like, you have such, you can handle this. You're so good at this stuff. Like you have all the skills, you'll be a great business owner. And like, I guess he's given me the confidence that most women, we always don't think we can do stuff, but we actually can. And it's nice. My spouse has literally been the biggest impact on my life. I mean, and he's a man. So unfortunately my question is not, my answer is not answering your question. (laughs) I just, there's not been a woman that's really impacted me tremendously. It's, it's been my husband, quite frankly. It's, I had a similar conversation the other day because I haven't, there are women who have influenced me for sure, but not necessarily at work. Yeah, I was talking to someone the other day that I never really had a great, I actually interviewed someone last week who was, I think the only great female boss I ever had. Like yeah. I, I, I didn't really have a lot of female mentors at work right. who helped me and inspired me and supported me and wanted me to do better. I think it can be really, really tricky. Yes. To, yes. In the business world in general to find, sadly, I think it's I know. a I mean, bummer and I'm hoping I'm creating a different environment here, but yeah. I think nowadays there's more females, but I'm, I'm 55 years old. So when I was working, starting out working, you know, this was a long time ago. There wasn't a lot of women in high level positions. When I was an attorney, I worked for a male equity partner. He was one of the top equity partners and he was notoriously hard and mean and very rigid. And we just meshed like he expected the best and you gave him the best. And he kind of instilled that expecting people to do good and to achieve a lot. And so it's kind of my mantra is, you know, I expect a lot of my employees because I've always given a hundred percent, 120% and I want everybody else around me to get, give 120%. So, you know, unfortunately the people I've worked for have usually been male, Yeah, but they can still instill, you know, some, some good values into you. I mean, of course there's women that I look up to, you know, I think Dolly Parton's the coolest yeah. woman in the world, but I, Love I her. Know I am her. looking at. I have artwork. I have Dolly Parton artwork looking over my. Yeah, desk. there's like you know the three people you want to have dinner with, or you would love to, alive or dead, and she's definitely one of the women I think I look up to because she came from nothing and she's so wonderful and has done so much. So, you know, there's definitely women like that that I look up to, but impacting me and my life, it's it's been my my husband. He's my best friend, and he's always encouraged me to do whatever I want, and so I'm very lucky. <laughs> love it. Love it. Well, this was amazing and thank you so much. And I am now so I was in New York last I week know. and I'm now kicking myself that I didn't hop down to the West Village for a donut. But next I'm from New York. Well, so I'm please there do. A lot. Please so come down. I, you'll it'll sure. blow your mind. It really will. It's a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. This thank was you. terrific. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 
Please check back next Monday for a new episode featuring marketing conversations through the lens of influence. I am your host, Danielle Wiley, and this is The Art of Sway. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Amy Rosenberg hosts a great podcast called PR Talk. Amy, tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen. So we interview thought leaders and sometimes the media to not only learn about our jobs better, but to expand into new areas that tie in well with PR. But we also explore kind of what we think is more interesting. So things like work-life flow, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and just broader topics like that. Very interesting. Where can people subscribe? We're at prtalk.co, marketingpodcast.net, or you can search for PR Talk wherever you get your podcasts. You heard her. Go subscribe. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.com.